Well, I want to welcome everybody. I'm Nathaniel Deutsch. I'm the director of the Institute for Humanities Research, also known as the IHR up at uh, UC Santa Cruz. And before I start, I want to thank a few people. First of all, the staff of the IHR, Irena Polich, who is the managing director of the IHR. See her. Hey. And Evan Guy and Courtney Mahaney, they're also here somewhere. Maybe they could. <laughs> Stand up. And I also want to thank the students, some of, some of whom you've met um, on your way in here, who have helped us to put together this event. Uh, we've had two partners, Bookshop Santa Cruz and Kumba Jazz Center, and, and I really want to uh, send out my thanks to them for, for their help. And before we start the event, I want to encourage you to sign up for a mailing list. If you haven't, you should have gotten a um, little card, postcard, on your seat. <laughs> and uh, they have our information, and our, our website, which you can uh, contact us through. And we have a lot of wonderful programming coming up. The author, Samuel Delaney, whose work some of you may know, yeah, <laughs> at least one fan here, um, on March 10th at the university. An event on May 18th at the Museum of Art and History connected to the Kinsey exhibit that uh, the IHR is co-sponsoring. And an event at Kumba celebrating International Jazz Day on April 30th. So uh, afterwards, if you want to talk to one of us at the IHR about any of those things, we would be happy to discuss it, uh, discuss it with you. So today is the second installment of a series called Questions of That Matter that we have been hosting. The last one was, the first one was last year on the cosmos. And then we brought together two faculty members, one from history, uh, one from physics. Mingwei Hu, who is a Chinese historian, and Anthony Aguirre, who's a theoretical physicist, to talk about the cosmos. And today we're going to continue with play, games, life, and death. And there are really two points of this series. The first point is to bring together scholars, one from the humanities, uh, literature, history, philosophy, linguistics, and so on, and somebody from another field to talk about a question that really matters to all of us. And I think it says a lot that our first event was on the cosmos, and the second one is about play in games. And I think it says a lot about the fact that, <laughs> that games have become such an important part. They always were, but and I think in a different way, and that's something I hope that our experts will, will talk about uh, today, such an important part uh, of our lives. The second reason that we started the series was to bring the university to you. We are a public university, so this is your university. And while I know a lot of you uh, sometimes make it up to campus, I think it's also important that we come here to town uh, to demonstrate the connection uh, between the public and the university in a really uh, important way. And it's also a lot of fun to come down here for us. So. <laughs> So we appreciate it. <laughs> now, uh, I want to introduce our, our faculty members today. First, Kimberly Lau, who is professor of literature at UCSC, where she teaches courses on virtual worlds, fairy tales, vampire narratives, and theories of gender, race, and sexuality. Her students are very lucky. Uh, one, of her, one of her ongoing research projects considers World of Warcraft, one of the most popular online games ever in relation to masculinity and its subversions. She's the author of several books, as well as articles, including The Political Lives of Avatars, Play and Democracy in Virtual Worlds. So thank you, thank you. Really for being here. <laughs> and our second faculty expert is Noah Wardrop Fruin, who is a professor of computational media, also at UC Santa Cruz. He co-directs the Expressive Intelligence Studio, a technical and cultural research group focused on games and computational media. His projects have been presented by art venues such as the Guggenheim Museum and the Whitney Museum of Art, as well as in games venues such as IndieCade and the Independent Games Festival and featured in field-defining volumes. So his students, I'm sure, have a lot of fun as well. His most recent book is Expressive Processing, Digital Fictions, Computer Games, and Software Studies. So the format... Uh, <laughs> The format of tonight's event is going to be a conversation with our faculty members here. And then I'm going to uh, open up the floor to, the, uh, to, to you guys. 
and I know, uh, I know some of you, so I know that there are, there are gamers, <laughs> there are parents of gamers, there are game designers, <laughs> there, are, there are otherwise interested people here. So I'm looking forward uh, to, to lots of good questions. And I actually only have a few, um, and we'll see how long it takes, and then, um, and then it'll be your turn to participate in a conversation uh, with uh, Kimberly and Noah. So my first question, and Kimberly, maybe you could start out, sure. is what does the word play mean? What does play mean? It's probably a very big question. There's a <laughs> lot of um, historical definitions and historical theory. But in general, when people talk about play, they often um, mean that which sort of falls outside of ordinary life. Play is often um, defined in relationship to other things like work, productivity. Um, and in fact, one early play theorist defined it as an occasion of absolute waste. And by that, he meant a very good thing. That for him was a huge compliment. But it gives you an idea of how historically we've really thought about play as this separate thing that's designated specifically as outside of our everyday ordinary lives and outside of our productive working lives. Yeah. And Noah, what, what comes to your mind when you, when you hear that word? Um, well, I think plays like sex. Um, it's one of those things we have a hard time saying really what it is, right? Um, it's some, something could seem sexy to you and not to me, or playful to you and not to me. Um, but I think there are a, a few other ways it's like sex that are, I mean, I'm not only going to talk about sex, but um, <laughs> uh, that are worth mentioning, right? So um, one is that um, it's kind of embarrassing and juvenile, right? You're, you're not supposed to be too interested in it when you get older, right? Mm. Um, it's something that um, is, uh, well, OK, I'm, I'm not getting embarrassed talking about play. But um, <laughs> <laughs> um, it's something that we have a really strong, inherent desire to do, right? Uh -huh. um, that We do it for its own sake. Um, and then also, we wouldn't really have humanity as we recognize people um, without it. It's really fundamental. It, I mean, I noticed in both of your responses that the word fun didn't come up. <laughs> is, is that, maybe it was implicit in, 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 in your Hopefully response. Hopefully it was implicit in what Noah was saying. But is that something that is, um, is that something you would, you know, kind of automatically associate with, with play or is, or no? Well, I think it's that question is sort of moving us forward in time when we really begin to see the, um, in our contemporary moment, the real breakdown between play and ordinary life. So the boundary between um, what we ordinarily think of as this sort of magic circle, to use some other game parlance, um, that frames play as a specific thing is really breaking down. And uh -huh. as that breakdown happens more and more, I think the concept of fun is called into question more and more. So for instance, there are many people who have looked at the breakdown between play and labor, for instance. And in some of these online uh, role-playing games, people spend a great deal of time doing what they call grinding or farming, doing repetitive activity over and over and over to perhaps make in-game money or currency to buy things that um, advance their gameplay. And many people have described that project or that process as labor, as mm. work, as tedium, but something that has to be done. So that's just one example of where um, fun may not necessarily be at the forefront of playing. And yet, at the same time, there's a way in which even that grinding can be fun because there's some sort of achievement attached to it or there's some sort mm. of sense of accomplishment and productivity attached to it. Mm -hmm. right. And you look at the work of, say, people like Virginia Woolf or Tony, C Tony Morrison or Lewis Carroll, right? What they're doing is um, obviously play with language, right? And, it's, and, it, and we can feel that coming off the page as we read it. And yet, I'm sure composing those books wasn't all fun, right? Mm -hmm. So I think we need to be sure that we don't swamp play with the assumption of fun. Um, mm -hmm. Play is much larger, I think. Mm -hmm. OK, well, that, that leads to my second question, which is how do you think, and you alluded to it a little bit, I think, how do you think that uh, our ideas of play have changed over time? Or, you or, want, yeah, okay. go ahead, yeah. Um, well, I think there are a lot of ways that questions could be answered. Um, for me, I'm particularly interested in how we've seen an explosion of types of games and 
um, therefore ways that we recognize people as playing, um, even just in the last half century, right? If you think about 50 years ago, um, now familiar forms like the tabletop role-playing game or the live-action role-playing game or computer games like you know, arcade games or um, simulation games or many other types of games that we now see engaging in them as a type of play where you, um, you know, we used to say that you performed a play, but now you take on a character in, in many, in, in much different ways as one kind of play, or you um, think about city planning as a type of play, right? You know, there, there are all these new types of play um, and all these um, new games that afford those types of play. And that's, to me, the, um, the most exciting change that has happened in what we mean by play historically, is, is that very recent history. Mm. Yeah, I would really agree with Noah there. I mean, I think, and just to reiterate what I said a bit earlier, this real breakdown of the magic circle, right? The breakdown of the frame. So that play enters into our everyday lives in um, often very minor ways and in often bigger ways. But I think a real fluidity or ambiguity between what is play and what is not play at any time is, um, at least from sort of a theoretical perspective or a critical perspective, what a lot of people are interested in. And I think people are producing games that force that um, experience as well, that force not just the sort of mainstream, multiple, um, massively multiplayer online role-playing kinds of games, but indie games that have really social justice outcomes are really forcing players into affective experiences or embodied experiences that might um, really give them a sense of what it might be like to live with depression or to live with poverty or to be a woman who um, is encouraged to stay on the path when in fact veering off the path might be the only way to make it home or not. You know, that, that um, we can in some ways see the ways that play is encouraging us to be empathetic in these socially conscious ways or games are encouraging us to do that, but the element of play is, cha is changing there, I, I mm -hmm. think, um, f especially from a sort of fun-oriented perspective. And, and what do you think is the relationship of play to games? You know, in, in coming up with the title, mm -hmm. um, we thought about, and, and I should say that what happens is that it takes about a year <laughs> to, <laughs> to, to plan one of these. And we had conversations with each other um, leading up to it, and we weren't sure what to call it. And I think we agreed that play and games should both be in there. Um, and it does raise the question of what, what exactly is the relationship to, between the two, because it, I don't think you need to have, you don't need to have games to have play, mm -hmm. but maybe I'm wrong about that. I don't know, what, what, do, you think about, what do you think about that? Well, I think what, um, the examples that Noah, ostensibly the non-humanist, gave a minute ago <laughs> um, from literature and um, playing with language is a great example of the fact that you can have play, certainly, without having games. But I think in our cultural moment, play and games are very tightly um, enmeshed, and yet we also see the way games are producing all sorts of things that aren't necessarily moments of play, I mm. would say. So I think that there's a relationship there for certain, but that games are also doing or have the capacity to do many other things. Like what's an example of a, of a game that doesn't involve play in your, in your opinion? Um, there's a game called Cart Life that forces the player to assume the role of somebody who um, makes a daily living selling newspapers in New York City on a kiosk or a cart, and how you play um, determines whether you'll be able to pay your rent, what your outcomes are. One of the outcomes of the game is suicide. It's not a playful game in that sense, right? It, it's a sort of, I think, would be described as a social justice game in which mm. you're to experience from another position someone else's poverty and mm. what the everydayness of that experience is like. So that would be an example where you're playing a game, you are inhabiting this other role, as Noah said earlier, but it goes against our very common ideas of what it means to play and mm -hmm. even what it means to play a game. Mm -hmm. It's hard to avoid being tautological, right? Um, there are lots of 
uh, languages that don't necessarily even distinguish between game and play. Um, so I could define games as things that invite and structure play. Well, and then you know yeah. they would be entirely overlapping. But yeah, you think about something like the Stanford Prison Experiment. Um, I can't think of any aspect of it that differs from how I would describe a live action role playing game, and yet it doesn't yeah. seem very playful to me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so you've designed some games, or been involved in the design of games. Do, uh, presumably not the Stanford experiment, <laughs> though, but, but do you? Accidentally once, accidentally. but yeah. Um, but, <laughs> Is, is play one of, the, one of the criteria, or the playfulness of a game? Is that something that you think about when you design a game? Or how does that, how does that factor in? Right, so I think um, you, you can focus on a lot of different things when you're making a game. Um, and I think there are people who focus on wanting people to feel the achievement of getting points and levels and badges and so on. And, and that's really uninteresting to me. Uh, I really am much more interested in play and trying to create new possibilities for play. I think um, play is becoming more and more um, infused into our lives. Um, and how we think about play and how we structure that play is going to be more and more important to what kind of society we are. And it's already deeply fundamental. Mm. How have games and gaming transformed the way we think about and construct identities and communities? I know you've done, you, you want to I take that first, Noah's but I know turn. you've done, okay, great. You, um, go, you go first. Well, so I'll try not to step on Kim's toes, um, because I think, you know, Kim's done really interesting work in thinking about um, how we represent ourselves through things like avatars, right, through the um, representations that we create of some portion of ourselves when we're playing online games um, and how we communicate to people through them and how we create communities. Would you mind them. defining what an avatar is? Sure. I'm sure most of um, you know what it is. But, but in this case, yeah. I just mean um, the physical embodiment of the character that I'm playing in a game. It usually also has some non-physical embodiment, right? So another thing that's changing about um, sort of identity in games is I remember in the early 1980s reading the Advanced Dungeons and Dragons rules, um, and I realized maybe not everyone knows. And, and that's, a, that's a tabletop role-playing game, um, and um, and it grows out of a, a tradition of simulation games, including war simulation games that go back to Prussian, you know, officer training games that are, are you know much older than any of us. Um, but reading those rule books and realize, and, and only later realizing this was the first time that I'd seen the idea of a, a person represented as numbers, right? Um, which is becoming a more and more familiar um, mm-hmm. thing in our lives now. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, this sort of um, statistical idea of an identity, I think, is something that um, we're learning about and um, playing with and reimagining through games. Um, and it's obviously in dialogue with a lot of things going on in our culture more broadly. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think there are a lot of ways to approach that question. On the one hand, we have identities um, and communities that are made possible by playing games, and sometimes there are alternative possibilities to what we have in everyday life. And, you know, there's been a ton in the news about, um, or just popular media, about um, the supposed flexibility of identity online, right? There's that famous New Yorker cartoon of the dog sitting at the computer, you know, on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. (laughs) So there's opportunity for play, for um, cross-racial avatars, for cross-sexual, cross-gender avatars and being and things like that. And there's also a real consolidation of sort of normative identity categories through representation. So at the, at the one, on the one hand, there are possibilities for subversion and play with identity. On the other hand, we have um, representations of um, sort of normative masculinity in first, most first person shooter games, which are like war, gears of war, et cetera. We have um, very stereotypical representations of women in things like Grand Theft Auto, where most of the women are prostitutes and you can, you know, literally rape them in the game. Um, There are um, consolidations or intensifications of racial identities in games like World of Warcraft, where all of the horde side, which is sort of the bad side, um, are representations of 
familiar to us ethnic categories. We would recognize in these mythical representations, these supposedly mythical creatures, I think we would recognize racial categories. So I, I think we see both of these sorts of things. And then at the same time, we see sort of vernacular practices that bring communities into being around games. So some of the work that I've looked at is with World of Warcraft, how do the vernacular practices create sort of an imagined community so that everyone who plays World of Warcraft feels like they're part of this gamer community. And again, I think we see there also the sort of um, positive, progressive, subversive possibilities and also the really conservative, dangerous ones. On the other hand, I mean, this is why the identity category of gamer is so um, important for some people, especially seems young men, that we have this whole phenomenon of Gamergate, which many of you may have heard of, a real backlash against um, the diversification of the field, the supposed um, conspiracy between feminist critique of games, female game makers, and you know those crazy liberal progressive journalists, you know, so, so we what happened exactly in Gamergate? With Gamergate, um, uh, <laughs> this is a very long story, so I'll try to make it as short as possible. Maybe Noah can help out. Um, uh, there was a woman who created, Zoe Quinn, who created a game about depression. Um, it was reviewed favorably by the critical game media. A short time after that, her ex-boyfriend wrote a vicious personal attack kind of blog about her. And in it, insinuated or, or um, used language that would inspire um, gamers, you know, people who identified in this conservative gaming category to um, understand the positive media response to her game as a conspiracy at, um, between both sort of the, fe the feminist critique and the um, progressive press, but also um, in the interim she had started dating um, someone who worked for this um, publication that had reviewed her game favorably, but he was not in any way involved in reviewing her game. Um, so it was a sort of very typical a uh, discourse of the only reason why her game is being reviewed favorably is because she slept with this guy, right? That's a familiar discourse. And in response, there was a lot of um, encouragement to use the Gamergate hashtag, um, and people were using that to send death threats and to do what's called doxing, which is to publish um, private information, such as her address and all her contact information, and encouraging death threats, um, encouraging rape threats. And then women and other people, but women were the ones who were really the targets of these attacks, female um, critics and other female game makers who came to her defense were treated similarly. Yeah. So it became a huge cultural phenomenon for about a year and a half, and, and it started as uh, ostensibly Gamergate ostensibly is also about transparency in the media. So there is this question of ethics at the center of it, but the practices that emerge from it and what most people mean when they talk about Gamergate is really about this other phenomenon. Mm. Yeah. Anything? Yeah, and you can see this kind of um, attempt to police the boundaries of what games are and what games should be in the reviews and responses to those reviews of other games around the same time, like Gone Home. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's, um, it's, it's a really disturbing phenomenon. It's one that I think most of us who teach about games and have um, you know, people in our classes who, who may be getting, um, let's say, a, a very a uh, distorted view of what Gamergate is and what it stands for by, from the media they consume. Um, it, I think it's really important to um, say, you know, um, hate speech is not acceptable or, um, or an expression of ethical <laughs> beliefs or anything no. like that. Um, and I think it's important to say it uh, in, in basically every venue that we can um, because um, even though I think these people are inevitably losing, right? Games are becoming something broader, mm -hmm. made by more people, for more people to express more things. Um, in this painful transition, um, those of us who have an opportunity to speak publicly um, have to say that it's 
um, mm. unacceptable. You know, as you were talking um, and you described uh, in Grand Theft Auto the possibility of somebody playing raping another character uh, in the game, and some of the other things that you've said, it really makes me wonder how games have affected our understanding of the real. Like, what is real? I mean, there are, yeah. some of this is, is legal because some things that you could do in a game, if you were to do them outside of the game, you could get prosecuted right. for it, yeah. right? Um, but I wonder, particularly for those people who spend so much time playing games, mm -hmm. I mean, another aspect of this is, you know, for them, where, what is the real or what, you know, yeah. rather than seeing games as virtual reality, it's possible that based on your, on the, certainly on the amount of time that one spends doing it, mm -hmm. that could be your primary reality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if yeah. you could, could speak to that. I, I think there are, um, the, the breakdown of the barrier between the virtual and the real or the game and the real is occurring in pretty much every sector of our lives. I mean, interpersonal relationships, the law, the economy, money, um, identity, work, labor. I mentioned an example earlier of how um, players are often confused about whether they describe what they're doing when they play these games as work, grinding, labor, or play. Um, and in some cases, I suppose, sometimes when we're working, it feels like play, although I don't know how often it goes that way. But, um, but these, these breakdowns happen, we read cases of them all the time. You know, so for instance, um, if, if a community of people only know each other online and they you know, become very good friends online, but they've never met, if one of the people disappears and, and they have real emotional responses to that and they later find out that maybe it was a hoax, you know, like maybe the person wasn't really a woman who was one of their friends, maybe she didn't really die in a car accident, this is a real case actually, um, maybe she didn't really die in a car accident, and yet they had this real mourning for her. Is that emotion somehow not real? No, it still is a real emotion, right? So I feel, feel like that's an example of a breakdown between the real and, and the, the sort of um, virtual, I mm -hmm. guess. But there's also, um, so those sorts of things happen all, all over the place. Like in the economy, there's real money trading, or there was, especially in the early part of the 2000s. I don't think so much anymore, because games have sort of, t um, game makers have taken control of that. But it, it used to be possible to um, make a high-level avatar and sell it on eBay for like $2,000. So there was this conversion of in-game goods and currency and things that you could trade for real money. And there's a great book about it called Play Money by Julian Dibble. Um, that probably is at Bookshop Santa Cruz. Um, <laughs> so, but, um, but there's this other, one of the things that I've been really interested in is the breakdown between the real and the virtual that happens in the individual and what I'm calling sort of the breakdown of subjectivity. That is the way that we have, you know, at least since the Enlightenment, thought of ourselves as bounded, contained individuals. Now I think we're seeing that perhaps the individual is not so bounded, that our boundaries of the self are actually porous and fluid, so that when we play some of these games, we have these embodied experiences, we have these affective responses that are being um, inspired by or motivated by things that are happening in the game. Um, and I think sometimes very profound ways, including around, um, uh, fear, um, death, for instance. People have really explored the ways that one can die in these games, and for some people that's meaningful, depending on the game and the, depending on the consequences. In many games, death isn't that consequential, which does lead many people to explore. Mm -hmm. But there are these ways in which I think our um, experience of playing the game pushes it outside of ourselves. Is our relationship with an avatar only a representation of who we are, yeah. or is there some kind of almost interpersonal relationship between us and the avatar? That's it's interesting that, that you know. that you that you historicize it in terms of um, since the Enlightenment and rationality. I because be, I, I'm not a no, no, I think it's no, I think you're absolutely <laughs> right in the sense that if you look, there there are many examples of things that you see now in gaming through gaming technologies that have existed in mm -hmm. some cases for millennia in more religious contexts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, the, many of which preceded. Um, uh, chronologically, 
of the modern notion of, mm -hmm. of self. So, for example, That's shamanistic right. mm -hmm. uh, travel mm -hmm. or uh, reincarnation, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, having multiple selves right. at different uh, or, or expressions right. of oneself at different yeah. what are really avatars, right? Even the name avatar. Yeah. So, in a way, it, it seems that games, uh, particularly recently, have 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 managed to uh, kind of substantiate. Mm -hmm through technology, things that people mm -hmm. imagined, or depending on what you believe, mm -hmm. actually did experience mm -hmm. previously yeah. through yeah. through other means. Yeah, I had never thought about it like that, yeah. but that's absolutely right. That's very interesting, yeah. And and, and, and what do you think about the, the relationship of games to the real? Also, I'm, I'm thinking, mm -hmm. you know, again, back to your experiences designing, um, designing games. Well, I think um, any experience that we have with a piece of media is a real experience, right? When I'm, when I'm sitting in a movie theater, that's a real experience. When I'm turning pages of a book, that's a real experience. But games, um, that experience of consuming the piece of media or, or enacting the piece of media is in many ways much more active, right? So first there are the things I do myself, but there are also the things that I do socially, right? So just like um, having a poker night or being part of a bowling league is a real experience. So is being mm -hmm. part of a guild in an online game, right? Um, so I think first there's that, that thing where we're consuming media, but also we're doing something more, something more ourselves, something more that's social. And then there's the change in the piece of media itself. Mm -hmm. So I think one example for exa is that um, games have taken simulation, right? The idea that what you're doing is um, creating a system for imagining many possibilities and essentially turned it into media so that now we have media that are about exposing a possibility space and in retrospect make other forms of media like fictional films or novels um, look like traces through a possibility mm -hmm. space. Whereas before, I would never have thought of them that way. Right? So I think- What do you mean by traces through a possibility? So um, if I- um, if I play a game, right, um, let's say I play a game like SimCity, right, I can make many, many possible cities that can be um, destroyed in many ways, my mm. own incompetence, natural disasters, right, um, you know, putting the power plants too close to where people are supposed to live. Um, and um, we, you, you don't seem to get fired for in real life, but in SimCity. <laughs> um, and, um, and so, um, and, but you know, you could also imagine a movie or yeah. a novel about, um, you know, a, a city growing and dying and the people who are trying to guide it in one direction or another and fighting over zoning and so on. And so SimCity, um, when I'm playing it, I'm thinking about all the alternative things that could have happened if I'd made other choices. And in retrospect or in context, if you, I think, play enough games where simulation of some sort is an important part of it, like we've been working on games where social simulation and imagining other things that could happen in the social world is a key part of playing. It makes other kinds of linear media experiences where you don't make choices seem like one possible route oh, see, through yeah. a simulation. Right? Mm -hmm. So, so what does the gamification of life mean to you? That 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 phrase. <laughs> um, so it's it, it, it means something obviously sort of painful. You can see me wink, right? Do you, um, do you get an annoyed? Do you get annoyed by that? Or? No, no. It's that. Um, so gamification um, has often been seized upon by people um, looking for something easy, right? Um, I want to take some experience that is fundamentally not engaging or fundamentally not um, even um, something people can stand doing. And <laughs> by adding the extrinsic rewards that we associate with games, you know, the points and levels and badges and so on that I was talking about earlier, maybe I can make it so people will do what I want them to do, right? Yeah. Um, and you know, it, as as a number of people have commented, it's really not that different from like the rewards card from my coffee place, except for the, the coffee place gives me coffee, <laughs> right? You know, I don't just get little stamps. Um, and um, and yet, I think you know, it also points in a much more interesting, much more difficult direction, which is to say, how do we take parts of life that are not currently intrinsically rewarding? and think about ways that they become more playful and creative and fulfilling. How do we think about, um, you know, Katie Salen and uh, Eric Zimmerman talk about play 
as something that can happen within a more rigid structure, right? So the play of language happens within the structure of language. The play of a steering wheel is how much you can move it before you start actually changing the direction of a car, right? Um, but I think those, um, there is something about thinking about play as, as points of freedom that is, um, that is opposed to the idea of gamification. And, mm. um, and then my question becomes, uh, is that play within the wider system making us, giving us the practice we need to do things like resist totalitarianism? Mm -hmm. Or is it the outlet that lets us go along with it? Um, and maybe it's both. I don't know. Yeah, there was a similar, Bakhtin, the literary theorist, came up with a similar argument about carnival, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. whether carnival allows us to uh, experience kind of revolutionary, or, or actually is a kind of mode of revolutionary behavior, or whether it's just letting off steam so that we return to our normal mode of being in the world right. until the next time there's a carnival. Right. Yeah. I, do you know of successful, can you, can you name it? at least one, let's say, successful example of somebody taking something mundane or even boring or torturous and <laughs> gamifying it so that it, it maybe not only becomes tolerable, but even enjoyable in some sense? Um, I mean, I think there are lots of um, small examples. The one I was just reading about this afternoon is, you know, they're, they're doing technical rehearsals for um, the Harry Potter world down in uh, Universal mm -hmm. um, in California. Apparently, the one in Orlando is across the street from a high school. Um, and um, the story I was reading was someone um, seeing the three broomsticks in the Harry Potter world full of all these um, teenagers in house robes doing homework. Um, and it sort of said, you know, mm -hmm. what are you all doing here, doing your homework in a theme park? They're like, oh, we're cosplaying. We're pretending we're Hogwarts mm -hmm. students, but we're doing our real homework. Oh, you know, okay. right? <laughs> <laughs> I got to remember that one. Okay. <laughs> All right. Very good. Let me yeah. just, I, I just want to add to what Noah was saying. As an example, I think um, maybe it's not, uh, as Noah's example also um, suggests, it's not structures that are put in place for. Um, the mundane to be more playful, but that this is something that comes from within us anyway. So um, a, another earlier uh, theorist who's been linked up with play a lot, Chixen Mahaley, I think I'm, yeah. Noah can probably pronounce it um, better. I've heard him say it before. But this theorist um, came up with this idea of flow, and he noticed that when people were doing extremely um, tedious work that they often created games in their own heads and challenged themselves and got into basically what we would call the flow and they then enjoyed that. So he um, cites the example of one person who was a um, machinist and he had to do something every 40 seconds. He had to make this piece every 40 seconds or punch a piece and he did about 600 and some each day. And he loved his job. He had been doing it for over five years and he, it, it was amazing to him. He had created a system where he would um, study his motion, study the product so that he could get his time down as far as possible. He got his time down into the 20s and this was um, an extremely rewarding and joyful experience to him. So I think this is another example yeah. of how this comes from within us, as Noah opened up by saying that play is something that we're drawn to, that's like almost inherent in us as humans. And I think these two mm. examples are really, yeah. really speak to that. But I just want to go back to what Noah was saying about, you know, his coffee place and, you know, at least he gets coffee when he gets all his stamps. <laughs> but I would say that that is also part of the gamification of life, right? That the gamification of life is very much driven in my eyes by capitalism. So all the rewards points that you get on everything, um, the uh, I think right now at Safeway there's like a Monopoly game, at McDonald's there's a Monopoly game, you know, that much of it is about um, racking up points by consuming, right? So not just making things that are tedious more enjoyable or not just perhaps things that we don't like to do. <laughs> Many people like to shop and are even more um, you know, thrilled by it when they're getting points, right? But the one that I think is more dangerous is sort of like the one that we wear, you know, the Fitbit, for instance, or these other um, health devices 
that also encourage us to upload our health information, upload our data, which then is very often sold. It's big data. We're participating in this. You know, we have, but that is also presented very much in a gaming format. We want to accrue points, um, be in competition with others, um, things like that. Mm. One of the one of the things that I've been reading about recently is the use of games uh, in therapeutic settings for burn victims, for example, um, playing games and in this case not getting through, let's say, a repetitive task, mm -hmm. but but the time that you are recovering, spending mm -hmm. that time in a way that decreases the amount of pain um, mm -hmm. you suffer. Um, so in the, in that in that spirit, what do you think? And this is the last question before or you'll have an opportunity to ask um, other questions. How do you think games will transform our future? And what will games look like in the future? Um, so I think games are going to become steadily more and more diverse. Um, and part of that is, frankly, because it seems like any successful, compelling, engaging, interactive experience is surely you're becoming called games, <laughs> um, and, you know. So, for example, things that would have been called, um, you know, interactive CD-ROM adventures um, a couple of decades ago are now being sold by companies like Telltale, and everyone just accepts that those are now called games, and, right? And why is that? Is that just um, because games has become ascendant as a kind of brand, branded as a new? As, as this umbrella term for a whole variety of things that were separate. I th yeah, I think it means you know it means um, so something something that you participate act in actively that you do for its own sake has kind of become the meaning of game in in terms of how things are marketed, right? Um, things that would have been called hypertext literature three decades ago are now called games, mm. right? And I think that's great, right? Um, I think that what we have is um, more and more people realizing, OK, I'm interested in this thing called games. I can expand the boundary of this thing called games. I can express new types of things called game, and call them games. And, um, and you know, that's why, um, you know, why we have a games degree at UC Santa Cruz, right? Is that we want people to come to games as something that has already helped them shape who they are and how they think about the world, and then say, well, this is a, a rapidly expanding and changing thing. How can I make it bigger? How can I make it speak even more to the things that I most care about? And that's just incredibly exciting. You know, um, we were the first campus in the UC system to have such a degree, and I think it's because it's a campus that's so friendly to interdisciplinary things. Mm -hmm. You get students who think about themselves um, and hopefully by the end, as people who are media makers, but also are programmers, and also are people who you know, um, love and appreciate existing games and yet are creating types of games that have never been before. So that's, uh, to me, just inspiring. Mm. Um, I'm glad Noah answered the second part of the question. <laughs> I figured he would be good at that. I'll take the first part of the question, which is yeah. really like, how are, game, how are games potentially going to affect our future yeah. or transform yeah. our future. And I think it's really not what games are going to do for our future, but how we're going to use games, how we're going to make games, what we want from our games. Because I think hopefully one of the themes that's come out tonight is that games are there. We can use them in progressive ways, or we can, or they can be very conservative. They have both impulses already, right? So we could use games um, to think about alternative futures. We could use games to think about alternative possibilities. We could go into a game like World of Warcraft and completely flood the market for leather or for um, uh, herbs or whatever reagents are there and shift the economy of that game, and in a small way, at least momentarily, change the paradigm from a capitalist paradigm in the game to a more, I don't know, just subversive paradigm. I don't want to say it's communist, but it's just, it's putting, calling the whole economy of the game and the very paradigm of the game into question. We could, um, Put, you know, we can continue to, to um, support independent 
games and platforms that make independent games accessible so that we can have games that help us imagine or empathize with or experience another person's um, experience of the world, you know, the way that someone else inhabits the world that might otherwise be closed off to us. The, all of those things are possible, and yet at the same time we see gamer get, you know, we see the real um, assertion of a strong desire for, among many people, for the mainstream game. We see the ways that those mainstream games continue to make money off of representations that are probably problematic for many of us in this room. So how games are going to affect the future really depends on what we choose to do with them, what kind mm. of pressure we put on them, what we choose to play, how we want to be involved with them, and, and how more and more people can become involved in making games, right? This is one of the reasons why this is a great um, major at our university. We, it, making games is now much more accessible to a greater number of people, um, in part because there are platforms that help you get there. You don't have to program mm -hmm. everything yourself, but you can also be a storyteller. You can be a narrative specialist. You can be an artist and be a part of the mm -hmm. teams that are producing these games. The, the games that um, the undergrads produce in NOAA's um, program, in NOAA's department, are unbelievable, and they work all year long in these multidisciplinary teams, much like real game developers do. Um, and and they sh they actually showcase their games, don't they, at the at the end of the year at the Rio? Don't yeah, they? the Rio Theater. I, I mean, so there's another the opportunity yeah. <laughs> for people to see these incredible games that these undergrads have developed. Mm. Yeah, and many of them are these social justice oriented games. I think, which is very exciting. Yeah. And I think. I think actually things are, I, mean, I don't want to talk about what's going on on campus too much, but things are getting uh, even better because we're um, starting a Bachelor of Arts in games in addition to the Bachelor of Science. And so I think we're going to see that interdisciplinary community get even more vibrant mm -hmm. at the undergraduate and faculty levels. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you to both of you. Thank you. Thank you. So we have time for questions. Um, there, somebody should be going around with a microphone. I, I have to say at the beginning, I can't really see people's faces it's well. Hard. So <laughs> I'll, I'll point to people sort of in a general way. There's somebody um, in the back. Oh. Somebody in the back. Yes, the person in the back there waving the hand <laughs> from, yeah. Thank you. Is this on? Hello? No. Thank you. had me thinking a lot, and I think a lot about play as the opportunity to take risks about possibilities and minimize the consequences. But of course, you've revealed to me how consequences are deeply one-sided. And you made me think a lot about drones and the one-sided consequences of play. So I wonder if you could speak about the war history of games mm. and also mm -hmm. how, how you two as, as influences on young people can help tip the scale in the so social justice direction without um, without also forgetting the relationship that games have had to warfare for so long. So, so okay. drugs. Do, um, I can't really speak about drones, but one of the other breakdowns I think that we're seeing between the virtual and the real is exactly what you're saying, and I forgot to mention, but the way that um, in the first Gulf War, for instance, there's been a lot of um, critical work and, and media work on the ways that that was entirely represented to us as if it was a video game, right? So a completely different kind of representation from, say, news footage of Vietnam. Um, where we were really seeing the corporeal costs of war. That's totally absented in the kind of war that we look at now. And of course, the DOD is a huge um, uh, partner in the simulation games and um, also, I believe, in using Second Life as a platform for some military training. I've, I've um, read about. So, um, I, and then just in terms of the teaching question, um, when I teach my class on virtual worlds, I, I teach the mainstream games so that people have an experience of that and also um, are able to critique 
that in the ways that they want to. But I, I just want to say I'm not entirely critical of that. I think that World of Warcraft, which is the game that I know, um, does offer opportunities for subversive play and for alternative socialities to emerge. But I, in addition to those games, I teach games like Cart Life and The Path. And I've, I taught Noah's game last time. Um, prom week, um, so uh, to try to bring together these things so that students can really reflect on what their experiences have, ha have been and then to learn about some games that they might not be as familiar with and what are the politics of both of those sorts of situations, yeah. Yeah, um, I really uh, recommend a game that tries to bring that question full circle. It's called Unmanned, it's by Mole Industria. And in that game you play a drone operator um, and then one of the things you do is go home and play war video games with your child. And um, one of the things that playing the game reveals is how different the representation of war is in games, where it's a symmetrical conflict, right? It's like you could die or you could not, right? Um, from being a drone operator, <laughs> which is entirely one-sided, right? It, it's not combat, it's hunting, right? Um, and the, the history, I think, is something that we really do need to talk with students about. Um, I think there's history that's techniques, right? So talking about how some of the techniques that are in modern games come out of things like training through Kriegspiel and so on, um, but also the technologies, right? That um, the technologies that the military paid for for flight simulation are really important to things like um, being able to play real-time 3D games. They're also important to things like Pixar films, right? Like, you know, they're not only important to that. Um, similarly, you know, the military pouring lots of money into the Rand Corporation and other places that were doing more resource-oriented simulations is important to simulation-oriented gameplay and so on. So um, I think those histories are important, but um, I think sometimes there's an unfortunate a uh, tendency to tell that is the only history, right? The history of games is also people um, getting drunk and playing cards, um, which was seen as much less honorable than sh killing each other, right? Um, <laughs> right? Um, and there's lots of other histories that go into the games and play that we have now, and we need to think about that history diversely, just like we need to think about our future diversely. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, another question. Uh, Ty? I could recognize you, Ty. I think you have. Oh, yeah. One of the things that you circled around, but I didn't actually really hear the the word or the or a discussion of, is games and learning. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, I mean, uh, uh, I think one common conception of games is they're just games. You know, mm -hmm. they're repetitive. They're a set of rules that are built into the structure of the of the game. And it's a little mysterious, actually, to understand exactly how learning or transformation might come about through playing a game that is rule structured and, and, and repetitive. So I wonder if you could say a little bit about this nexus between uh, games and learning. And I'm particularly interested also in the degree to which games might have an effect on our formal education, both you know at the I mean, obviously, at the university level, you're teaching about game design and about the history of games and so forth, but also, um, you know, ways in which it might pervade pedagogies that aren't necessarily game design oriented, but but nevertheless might uh, benefit or be changed by the relationship to games. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, right now, we're one of the projects we're working on is a game about climate change. And um, if you look at the games about climate change, of which there are quite a few out there, um, they're almost all numerical simulation games, right? They're trying to take some simplified version of the kinds of simulations that scientists look at and make it accessible to a broader audience in the hope of educating them about climate change. Um, and I think that's noble, but I think that's also going to reach a really limited audience. Um, so the, the game that we're trying to make right now, um, while it includes some facts that are numerical facts about climate change, um, all the 
modeling that we've tried to do is much more qualitative, right? Like, you know, what is the connection between deforestation and climate change isn't represented as numbers going up and down, but more just like, you know, one exerts a force in the direction of the other. Um, and the kind of, um, the kind of roles that we're trying to put you in are not things like, um, not things like uh, someone who has the power to change everything in the world. Oh, I can just change this dial and suddenly coal production goes like this. I can change that dial and solar power goes like that. Um, but rather, people who are in difficult situations, right? Like one of the scenes that we've been working on is you're, you're having dinner with people and they're trying to ask you why you do this obscure science on this species that's dying out because of climate change, right? And, and putting you in this position where you're trying to sort of juggle passing dinner dishes and answering these uncomfortable <laughs> questions, and, and one of your friends just wants to know about your dating life, right? Um, um, our, our sense is that you know, this might actually um, result in some audiences that, that don't care about fiddling the knobs or that don't connect with fiddling the knobs to think about climate change in another way. Um, and our hope is that we might actually gather some information from the way they play the initial parts of the game to generate future parts of the game in response and kind of take them through an experience that challenges their initial beliefs and then brings them toward um, what we think is, well, we're working with people like Terry Root, one of the people who shared the Nobel Prize for the Inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Project, um, to bring them more toward what is actually happening in terms of climate change, but not through getting them to, you know, fiddle numbers until supposedly, you know, insight happens, which I think is actually a small part of the population for whom that happens. Um, and of course, it's research, right? I mean, I think the role of the university is to do things that could fail, but that if they succeed, could give us some interesting insight. Um, so, so anyway, which is a long way around to saying, for me, I think there's a lot of potential for games and education in a lot of areas. Um, but some of the possibilities that interest me um, are not necessarily the lowest hanging fruit that are most often pursued. Mm -hmm. I guess I don't have a great response, but it makes me think of um, this range of studies that um, psychologists have done in many places, but especially at Stanford, between um, individuals and avatar identification. And one study um, indicated that people who watched their avatar run um, were more likely to go out in the world and run. And another study um, showed that people who had taller avatars, this was very important study for me, <laughs> people who had taller avatars um, were less likely to accept an unfair splitting of $100 um, that was proposed to them by a short avatar, but the short avatar, the person with the short avatar was much more likely to take a negotiated split that was not in his or her favor. So 25-75 was much more willing to accept that. And then uh, um, another one was about um, the attractiveness of the avatar and, and um, how much personal information that person would be willing to reveal. So I mentioned these studies because it seems like um, because of the, and these are people who were only assigned avatars for this particular short study. They hadn't even developed a long term relationship with their avatar. So it seems to me that there's a potential there if avatars have this kind of um, effect on us, on our psychology and our way of interacting in the world as well as with other people, that there could be an educational opportunity there. I don't know what it would be, but I, those are the studies that come to mind that I think are kind of interesting in that context. Mm. I, see, I see a bunch of hands. I want to first ask whether there's anyone who's under 18, and I'll take your word for it, that wants to ask a question. There's, I saw a hand go up, because, but, but not about the question. So is there anyone who wants Maybe to ask a question? OK. Uh, in the absence of, do you want to ask a question? You're close to 18, I think. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I am, I'm an undergrad here at UCSC. Yes. Um, so on the study at Stanford, the balance and Proteus effects study yeah. that you mentioned, um, 
I was wondering, uh, for all of the potential that games have for uh, social justice and progressivism and, and the potential for transformative uh, positivity in the world, there's also another side of the future of gaming that I wanted to touch on with, um, have you heard of Sesame Credits? It's this uh, like gamification of a social network system through Tencent in China that right now is optional, but in 2020 will become mandatory for all citizens. And right now it's, um, it's set up such that you may get like visa benefits or you can, yeah, like you can travel outside the country more easily or uh, your, your you know, governmental systems are more quick to respond to your needs uh, depending on the score that you get mm -hmm. in your social media site. Mm -hmm. But the real insidious element of it is that if you are friends with someone who has a low score, your score goes down. So you're oh. actually positively incentivized to cut off wow. people of like lower governmental like normalization. Uh, so what do you think about the negative potential and danger in the processes of gamification in our world? So. Uh, absolutely, uh, you know, I think you're absolutely right to bring that up. And it was what I was trying to um, get at in my final comments by suggesting that uh, how, how games affect our future is really up to us. I know that sounds sort of cliche, but there is this mechanism out there and we have to, or this tool out there and we have to decide how we use it. Of course, we can't decide what happens in China, probably very directly, but I think we can decide for ourselves in many ways. And I think that's part of what Noah and I are both sort of working on with students is like, what are you aware of? What can you change? What are your politics? What are the ethics that you bring to this? And in many ways, I think your example is a great one because it shows us that gamification of life is really just an intensification of what we already have. In, in China, in many cases, people benefit from the social relationships that they have. They benefit from the um, party propaganda that they espouse or not, right? They, who they know um, often influences the degree to which they can travel and things like that. So again, we see here when we were talking about gamification of life, we're talking about the intensification of capitalism, I think. Um, in China, we're seeing the intensification of the social network or right as a way of distributing benefits and goods. And if we looked someplace else, we would probably also see whatever is culturally happening, gamification, just augmenting that, unless we choose to intervene in that somehow, is what I would say, yeah. I think that's a great answer. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, yes, sitting down with your hand, yes. Um, when you talk about the future of games, are you necessarily talking about things that are online or electronic? And also, if so, how important is anonymity to that? So I, I don't think we're talking only about things that are online and electronic. I think that's one of the puzzling things to me, and maybe if I was a better historian, I, I wouldn't be so puzzled. But I'm, I'm really curious as to why, in the second half of the 20th century, we started seeing this flowering of lots of different types of play. It would be really easy to say, oh, well, that's because general purpose computers started being around then. Um, but that's just not the answer, right? Like, that's not where Dungeons and Dragons came from, right? Um, and I, I don't, you know, that's not where um, the new games movement mm -hmm. came from, right? Mm -hmm. That's not where, you know, so I guess I'd say, Yes, when we talk about the future of games, we're talking about things that are electronic and online. We're talking about things that aren't electronic and online. And I think we're increasingly also going to talk about things that, that um, bridge between those two categories. Um, but yeah, we, we certainly shouldn't be talking only about one. In terms of privacy, I think that's um, a really interesting question because you know, as we've seen with companies like Google, a very successful model um, economically at this moment appears to be give people something that they want, right? Um, a word processor, an email system, a game, um, in return for as much data as you can possibly get from them, right? Um, I don't see that changing right away. Yeah, I don't, I don't really have much to add to that. I think that's right. I think that's right. Okay, see so, uh, one person over there. Yes, in the back, on the right. Yes. Yeah, um, I'm really curious. Thanks. Really fascinating. Totally fascinating. I'm curious about uh, 
a couple of things. We started out talking about play, and then we veered off much more into games. Uh, 12 years ago or so, there was a lot of talk about virtual worlds, which are not exactly game spaces, although they are play spaces. I'm really curious as to what you both um, think about where that went and, and, and how that happened and what might be going on there, if anything. It's also interesting that we've been talking about playing and um, we haven't thought about sports at all, which is, in, in some sense, a, a form of play that's been there for a long time. And we also haven't thought about theater, which is a, a play. Now, so this is like four topics. Do, do whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, I think um, we, we've slipped into games because that's what Noah and I work on more than the other things. But um, certainly, you're right. I mean, I, I think of um, sports as, again, sort of the um, uh, one thing I didn't say is that when we think about games and play, we're also often thinking of this sort of interaction between the vernacular and the official. So um, like everybody can go out and buy Monopoly and have the official rules, but how you play among your friends or in your family is this vernacular practice, right? Like do you put money in the middle and someone gets it when they land on free parking or no, right? The, those rules are negotiated. But with sport, I think, um, we also see that split. We see sort of everyday sport and activity, and then we see the professional leagues, right? And and we don't see so much in between. So I think there's a whole there's a whole humongous literature there um, that's very interesting. But obviously, I don't know very much about it. Um, but you um, you you asked a question about virtual worlds and what you see going on there, given um, there was an explosion of interest, uh -huh. you know, some 12 to 10 years ago. Yeah. It seems like that's really ebbed out. Yeah. It is extent, but a lot of what you said about identity and about, you know, trying your avatar is as much or even maybe more, it's a more malleable situation than, say, a World of Warcraft right. or, or a shooter or whatever, where your, your options, the rules and the boundaries are much more rigid and in the virtual world, they're not. So by virtual world, you mean something like um, second, life. second Life in particular, yeah. Well, one of the um, interesting things that's come out of some of the economic analyses of what I call virtual worlds, and when I, when I use the term virtual world, I mean like a much larger scope, including from these multi multiple player online games. Um, so not just things like Second Life, but one of the things that has been really interesting is that it turns out people actually like and prefer constraint. Um, which totally goes against what we would imagine because there's all these writings about utopia, there's all this imagining and fantasizing about utopia. If we had a perfect world, or if we had a world that we could create entirely for ourselves where resource, resources weren't constrained, identity wasn't constrained, you know, really basically nothing was constrained, which is what Second Life was, wouldn't that be exciting? And what a lot of game theorists and game critics have found, um, or people who study play and alternate um, universes, virtual worlds, is that actually people lose interest in those. What is appealing to people is constraint and is scarcity um, because that allows for hierarchy to emerge, it allows for status, it allows for a sense of accomplishment and progress and skill. These are all, of course, capitalist ideologies, right? And so we've internalized this system, this ideological system that we live with, and I think it's made it very hard for um, Second Life to sustain itself in that way. It just doesn't seem to have the massive consumer appeal that these games with constraint do have, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, and I guess I'd just add, um, games are subject to hype cycles, like lots of other things that are new, right? And so we've you know, had a lot of media attention, like, oh my god, people are playing games on their phones. Oh my god, people are playing games in web browsers. Oh my god, people are in virtual worlds. Um, and then the hype cycle moves on, but it's not like I stopped playing games on my phone. It's not like we stopped interacting with people in virtual worlds. Um, so I think part of it is, yes, you know, some of the excitement is not borne out and then people move on, but part of it is just attention moves on, even if the phenomenon keeps happening. Um, and that's also true of the negative phenomenon, right? Like, we, we aren't seeing as many news articles about Gamergate, but harassment doesn't stop, right? Okay, I think we have time for one more question, and then, and then um, 
if people have questions, maybe they can come yeah. up to you and, and, and ask afterward. Yes, uh, in, in the front row. Okay. Yeah. Um, mine is sort of. Thank you. Um, I sort of have a response to what you were just saying uh, in response to his question, which I really liked, and I was thinking along the same lines. Um, you said that that those those drives for success and for definite indicators and that hierarchy, you, you kind of um, said that capitalism was the source of that. And respectfully, I think <laughs> that you're wrong. I think that capitalism and the need for that in games comes from just our biology and our evolutionary history. And that's not a question, but I wanted to <laughs> say it because it leads up to my question. Which is, we've, we've talked and I've heard great questions about um, games and play and their capacity for uh, everything from self-esteem to plugging through tasks that people don't like to learning. Like I personally use a, a language learning app called Duolingo, which is great. You all should download it. I, they didn't pay me, but it is good. <laughs> um, so my question for both of you is, in the future, is everything gamified? I mean, you mentioned that we're calling more and more things games. Is that trend going to continue? And if so, what is, what does that look like? Where does that leave um, everything that's not games? Well, I, I would say, first of all, I find it very gratifying and inspiring that, um, that you don't read the sort of desire for accumulation and progress as capitalists. So that is hope for the future, <laughs> I think. Um, uh, in terms of the gamification, like the increasing gamification of life, it seems to me that we're on that trajectory right now. If that's not a trajectory that we want to be on, I think we have to actively um, reroute it, is all I would say. And we could even do that by creating other kinds of play spaces and other kinds of games that might not um, be moving us along the same kind of um, intensities that gamification is currently taking. Like we could still have gamification of life and it could take other forms, I guess, is what I'm saying. And yeah, I, I guess I would say I believe that we are seeing a period where games and other forms of media that are driven with or in dialogue with play um, are changing our culture and changing our media environment the same, the same way the moving image did, right? Um, and it is possible to escape television in the occasional public space, right? But, but no, on some level there is no escape from the moving image and maybe there will be no escape from play. Um, except for those spaces where you deliberately create it. But I think we will mm. deliberately create it. You know, we don't, I don't want anyway all notion of play to be swamped by fun, and I don't want all notion of life to be swamped by play. All right, well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.